um, I often say that even though you feel you might have something to say, you really have to rely on other people to give you that platform. So I just want to say to all of you guys, I really appreciate that. Um, so your first question, what was that like for me? Well, I'm just going to go back a little bit and talk about, um, you know, I had already attended uh, kindergarten at an all-black school where everybody looked like me. Uh, I had a teacher that reminded me of my grandmother. There were uh, lots of kids in my class, probably 35 kids, to one little teacher. Uh, but for me, in kindergarten, the more the merrier. But what was really happening around me at the time like, that all of us now realize is that our schools were often said that they were separate but equal, and that was really not the case. Even for a six-year-old, yes, having 34 other kids in the class was so much fun and amazing to me, but the school was overcrowded. And so that's what Brown versus the Board was all about. It was about equal opportunities um, when it uh, comes to education. And so um, I remember what kindergarten was like. But, you know, we were in the middle of the civil rights movement and they were trying to spearhead that movement, making school, sure that schools were integrated. Even though Brown versus the Board had happened in 1954, it was not implemented right away. And so here we were in 1960 and it had not happened in New Orleans. And so there was a knock at the door. My parents, they were very young. Both were born and raised in Mississippi, sharecroppers. And, uh, you know, being a sharecropper, um, going to school was a luxury that they really could not afford. They were the help. And so if it was time for them to get the crops in, the school was secondary. And so I believe that when that knock came at the door, they were told, if you have a six-year-old child, um, would you be willing to send your six-year-old to one of these integrated schools for the very first time in the city? Uh, that it would allow them an opportunity to have a better education and possibly go on to college. I think hearing that, they wanted for their kids what they could not have. And so my parents agreed. I should say my mother. She had to twist my father's arm. <laughs> Finally, he gave in. Like most of us women, you know, we usually are pretty persuasive. And she was. I have to honestly also say, before I finish answering the question, that my father was um, um, in the military, and he fought in the Korean War, where he was um, hurt, received a um, Purple Heart for bravery, and he would often say that, you know, when he got back from the military, he couldn't find work. Even in the military, he was just treated as another colored soldier. He said you could be in a foxhole with a white soldier fighting for the same country. You were brothers, then you had each other's back. But at the end of the day, if you lived, you couldn't go back to the same barracks. And you couldn't eat in the same mess hall. He was a colored soldier. And so he felt like if things didn't change for him, once he got back home, then sending his daughter to this white school wouldn't change anything. And so that's why he was against it. I remember that all of us uh, kids who had been signed up to go to these integrated schools, and there were only two schools chosen in the city, and they made sure that those two schools were located in the most racist parts of the city. Because if it was going to fail, then that's where we were going to fight amongst ourselves the most. And so I remember uh, having to go downtown and sitting with this large group of kids. There were really about 150 families who signed their kids up uh, saying, yes, we want our kids to go to better schools. The test was supposedly set up so that um, these kids could be tested to find out if they were smart enough to go to these uh, new white schools. The truth of the matter is, is that the test was set up to eliminate kids. Same tactic that was used when African Americans tried to register to vote. And so I remember taking the test, um, stuck to 
out in my mind. It was the first time that I had taken the streetcar and left my community and went into a whole different part of the city. So I definitely remember it. I remember that the test took all day to take, and uh, finally we went home. A couple of weeks later, my parents had visitors that told them that I passed the test. Truth is, is that out of nearly 150 kids, only six kids passed that test. Um, point that I like to, you know, <laughs> make all the time is that all six were girls. <laughs> Thank God for strong women. <laughs> and so uh, those six girls were divided up. Three were assigned to one school and three to the other. A couple of days before it was time to go, two of those kids dropped out. Their parents pulled them out. Because we were being divided up by um, districts, uh, the two kids that dropped out were assigned to go to school with me. So that left me to attend school alone, and the other three girls went to the second school. Um, people kept coming over, congratulating my parents, saying, oh my gosh, she's so smart, she passed the test. You know, please leave her in, don't take her out. Uh, and I heard that. But you know, growing up in the African American community back then, I was pretty much raised the way my parents were raised. You were seen, but you weren't really heard. You could not even be in the same room when grown-ups were having grown-up conversations. So it wasn't like I was privileged to that. What I did here, I was, as my mom would put it, being womanish and overhearing, overhearing what they were saying. And uh, so I heard them. And uh, some of them even congratulated me. Oh, you're so smart. You know, you passed the test. I say that because in my six-year-old mind, the only thing that my parents ever said to me is, Ruby, you're going to go to a new school today and you better behave. And that's what I was concentrating on, behaving. They never thought to explain anything to me. And so when that knock came that first day and they opened the door, there were four very tall white men standing at the door. And I saw that they had these yellow bands on their arms. And I remember thinking to myself, who are they? And I heard them say, we're U.S. Marshals, and we've been sent by the President of the United States that we're here to escort you and your daughter to school today. And that did not happen when I was going to kindergarten. This was all new to me. Everybody was making a big deal over the test. Even people in my community seemed so excited about all of this that in my mind, I really thought that the test that I took meant that I was so smart that I could go from first grade straight to college. And so I say that because the fact that they did not explain anything to me, I made things up in my own head. And so I thought it was college. I remember when we got into the car with these four men and we started that very short drive because it was a short drive to my new school. Um, I remember the conversation in the car they kept explaining to my mom how we were to get out of the car and walk. And they said, Ms. Bridges, we're going to um, you know, allow the marshal in the uh, front to get out first, and we'll get out. We'll surround you and your daughter. We want you to walk straight ahead and don't look back. But again, living in New Orleans, and, and you are aware of this, uh, right now we are in the middle of Mardi Gras season, and that was something that I grew up with. It was exciting for us. A lot of times people outside of the city feels like Mardi Gras is something they see on Bourbon Street. And that's really not the case. It's a real family event where we all look forward to it. We go out and we choose a spot and we sit and we barbecue like we all do. And, uh, you know, family comes around. And so that was exciting for us. You can often be riding along and stumble into a parade where you have to stop. And you have to wait and let it pass. And so when I was in the car and we got in front of the school, that mob that I saw outside of the school reminded me of my girl. They were shouting and they were waving their hands and throwing things. And there were police officers everywhere and the people were standing behind barricades. So for me, that means my girl. So there I was, six years old, thinking I had passed a test where I'm going to college. Stumbled into a Mighty Girl 
operate. I'm so excited. I'm not afraid at all. They opened the door and they rushed me inside of this building. And um, they took me straight to the principal's office. And when we went into the principal's office, the very next thing that happened is all of those people that had been waiting outside who knew that schools were going to be integrated that day, they did not know which school. So they took their kids to school, which is something they did every day, but this particular day they didn't leave. They wanted to see if it was their school. So when I drove up with federal marshal, they knew it was their school. And as I was sitting in the principal's office, all of those people that were outside, they rushed in to the building. Several marshals stood right outside the door, and as they would pass the principal's office, they would point at me and scream and shout, and their faces seemed really angry about something. I remember sitting there the whole day. I was never escorted to my class because they would go into every classroom. They would get their kids, and they would pass back by the window. I could see them. And that happened all day, and finally when the bell rang, school was over, the principal came in and she said, school is dismissed, you can leave. And I remember sitting there with my mom and watching all of this, and I saw the clock on the wall, and I remember it said 3 o'clock, and I thought, wow, college is easy. <laughs> and what really happened is the school emptied out before me, and those kids never came back. And that is what my first day was like. Mm -hmm. Wow. When I, when I hear you say that, right? So like I said, we've, we've seen pictures, we've, we've heard stories. Um, but to think about you walking in that day thinking this is a parade, this is exciting. This is me being, you know, I've, I've reached this great accomplishment. All the while, the experience was exactly the opposite. Um, as an adult now, right? So if you obviously fast forward, you're an adult now. What have you since learned about that era, that experience that, you know, six-year-old Ruby couldn't possibly have understood? So obviously you, you went in thinking this was a great experience, or going to be this great experience. And now, many years later, what what have you learned? Well, I can tell you what I, what, I, what I did learn. I learned that year. And, um, no, I wasn't aware of what was happening around me. And, you know, being a, a mom and a grandparent myself today, I didn't understand then. You know, it really bothered me that I didn't understand what was going on around me. And for a while, I was a little bit upset with my parents, even as I, you know, became a teenager because I didn't understand it. But now being an adult and a parent, how would you explain to your six-year-old that you are about to take them into this hostile environment, that they don't really like you. They don't want you there. I can't even go with you every day. I can't be in the classroom with you. They're there to harm you. How can you explain that to your six-year-old and think that they're gonna be okay? And so they didn't. And so now I understand that. I didn't in the beginning, but I remember that day, the very next day when I went back to school, the school was empty. And I remember walking up the stairs and, you know, the, uh, the other thing that I remember about that is that even though they told us schools were separate but equal, this school was totally different from the all-black school that I've gone to. You know, floors were so shiny I could see myself in the floor. And, uh, you know, I remember hearing my footsteps when I walked up the, this empty building with these four men. And when I got to the top of the stairs, the principal who really didn't want me there, she was part of the opposition, said, your class is down the hall. She wouldn't even touch me. I remember that. And we, they turned me around and they walked me down the hall to this classroom. And when I got there, the door opened. And this woman stepped out and she said, hi, my name is Mrs. Henry. I'm your teacher. And I, I, to this very day, I can remember looking at her and thinking, she's white. You know, I've never seen a white teacher before, let alone been in contact one-on-one -on -one with a white person. And yet, she looked exactly like the people outside who seemed really angry in their faces, upset about something. 
And so I, I can remember at six being a little bit hesitant about this. But she said, come in and take a seat. Very nice, soft-spoken voice. I went in, I took a seat, and she began to teach me. And it did not take me long to realize that, you know, she looks like them, but she's not like them. And I often say is that she showed me her heart. And even at six, five, four, your child is going to know if you care about them or not, if you like them or not. So I knew that. And I knew she looked exactly like them, but I knew she was different. She made school fun. I knew that I was going to learn something new every day. I was excited about school. I mean, up until that, you know, moment when I finally realized what was going on, I, I didn't want to miss a day. Uh, she made me feel safe. Uh, we did all kinds of fun things in the classroom. I knew she cared about me. I knew she loved me. And I never missed a day of school. But the one thing she couldn't make me forget is that I didn't see any other kids. And I knew from my past experience that school meant there were lots of kids, and yet the school was different. I could never go to the cafeteria. I could smell food cooking. And I thought, well, the kids must be in the cafeteria. They're cooking for somebody. I can't go. So I thought the kids were in the cafeteria, which led me to take my food and throw it away, my sandwiches, because I thought if I throw my food away, they're gonna have to take me to the cafeteria and then I can make friends. There were times when I could hear kids, but I could never see them and she never said anything about it. Um, I learned from her, I believe, to this very day, the exact same lesson that Dr. King died trying to teach us that you are to never judge a person by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Being with her in that room, her showing me her heart, me at six looking at her and knowing she looks like them outside, but she's not like them. I believe the lesson I went there to learn was that you can't look at someone and judge them that you have to get to know them. And that stuck with me all of my life because I learned it right there. Yes, she taught me reading, writing, and arithmetic, everything else, but the real lesson that I went into that classroom to learn, that I was chosen to learn, you can't look at them and tell. I learned that at such a young age, you know, so many of us are still, people still learning that at this age, um, I want to talk about resiliency. Autumn mentioned that our theme this year as an African American Black Enterprise Resource Group for Black Future Month is resiliency in the African American community. And my guess is the 1,500 people on this call today, when they think about resiliency, they can't think about that after hearing what you just shared without thinking about you. Your six years old, you mentioned you're supposed to be having a really new friends and learning and exploring and doing all of these great things. Um, yet for you, it was such a difficult time. You had to overcome so much adversity at this precious young age. When you think back, how were you able to become and remain so resilient? Right? Like those are skills we, we take all of our children's years trying to teach them. And many of us as adults are still learning. How at six were you able to even with all the love from parents and this awesome instructor, how were you able to remain so resilient? You know, I really don't know that. I really believe, uh, you know, I'm a firm, first of all, all of us, especially the community that I grew up in, you know, all of us believe in our faith and we stand on it. And I believe that that is because from the very beginning, that's all we had. All we had was each other in our faith. If we go back and think about how many people we lost and everything that those people went through and endured, it was what we endured is nothing compared to what they had to go through. And but they stood on their faith and I think they passed that down to us. And so the one thing that I do remember is that my mom said, Well you you know, you know if you're ever 
never afraid and I'm not with you. You can always say your prayer. And for me, I believed her because um, the one thing that you will notice in some of the photographs is um, in the crowd there were a person or people that would bring a baby's coffin, with a real baby's coffin, and they put a black doll inside of it. They didn't bring it every day, but the days that they did in that crowd, I would see it. And I would have nightmares about it. I would go back and, and I would have these nightmares where the coffin would fly around my room. And I would wake up and go to my parents' room and she would say, well, did you say prayers? And sometimes I forgot and I would say, I forgot. And she said, well, that's why you had the nightmare. You should go back and get on your knees. And if I did that and said my prayers, the nightmare would go away. So again, in my six-year-old mind, she was right. If I'm afraid, all I have to do is say my prayer. And there's a part in one of my books where it talks about the prayer, how the teacher saw me and I was praying. But I did say my prayers. I would say my prayers before school and after school. And if I forgot, I would go back and say them because I thought that they would work because they worked for everything else. So I have to say part of it was my faith. Um, and part of it, I believe that, you know what, I believe we all come here with a purpose, each and every one of us. Some of us find out what that purpose is before we leave here. If we're lucky, some of us don't. I believe I really stepped into my purpose. I honestly believe that. And so I believe a lot of what I needed was already in me. I do. And there was just certain things that happened that helped to bring that out. And one thing I do know, a friend of mine said to me, oh, you know, Dr. Bridges, you are, you are brave. You hear people say that all the time and you say, oh, no, no, no. So, but the truth is, is that you are brave. Because what I do know about you, and this was a very close friend, dear friend of mine, what I do know about you is that when you are backed into a corner, you will come out of the corner. And I had to stop and think about that. But you know what? That person is right. Because I've been in the corner many, many, many times. And when I'm in the corner, I don't think anything is going to happen in the corner. So I feel like I have to just step out. And let whatever's going to happen, happen, and then I can deal with it then. But as long as I'm in the corner, I'm stuck there and nothing's going to happen. And, I, and so that person made me realize that. And so I think that, you know what, maybe that is what we call bravery or whatever. I'm not, I don't believe I'm the only one that possess something like that. There's lots of us. I believe somehow it's in all of us. Dr. King had to step out of the corner. Rosa Parks had to step out of the corner. Fannie Lou had to step out of the corner. Nothing's going to happen in the corner. And that's how I really feel, and I think that was just innately there. And it took a lot of different things to happen for me to realize you just have to step out. That's powerful. Um, thank you for stepping out. <laughs> because we wouldn't be where we are today if you had. So I just have to say that. Um, I'm going to fast forward just a little bit. So a lot of focus has been on the six-year-old walking into and integrating a school. Teenage years are tough for the best of us, right? Um, if you fast forward to your teenage years, talk to us about what that was. Did you get to see change happening as you grew up? Or did you, that same experience that you had on that very first day, was that repeated over and over throughout your years and, and as you were growing up into a teenager? Well, the truth of the matter is, when I went back to second grade, you know, that was over. I didn't have to be destroyed by federal marshals anymore. The mob outside gave up. They sensed that this was not going to change. And when that happened and I went back to second grade, I remember going right back to my classroom where my teacher was and my teacher wasn't there. Again, no one explained anything to me. My best friend was gone. That particular class was no longer my class. It was like, like that. Everything changed all over again. I was then being taught by one of the teachers who had refused to teach me the year before because they were teaching 
teachers who quit their job. They did not want to teach black kids. And if they stayed, they just stayed. But I was solely Mrs. Henry's responsibility. No one else would even touch me. And so now here I was in second grade in a class with black and white kids that was also different. And Mrs. Henry came from Boston and she had this really strong Boston accent. And this was a woman that was teaching me my alphabet, how to read, how to pronounce words. And so when she left, she left me with this really strong Boston accent. You know, in this class, <laughs> all these other little southern kids. And whenever it was my turn to read, um, the teacher that was teaching me would say, that's not how you pronounce that, take a seat. So I never really wanted to talk. I say all that to say is that everything had changed at that point. What had happened the year before was over with schools now across the city were integrated and no one really wanted to talk about it. It was a very, very hard time for my parents. They were consumed where the next meal was going to come from. Um, so the fact that it was over, no one spoke about it. No one in the city really wanted to talk about it because, you know, they knew that the whole world had watched how they behaved. So no one wanted to discuss it. It was like it never happened. It wasn't like I could go back to my classroom, open up my history book, and find any answers. Like, why me? How did it happen? Why did it happen? Well, that, that wasn't really a test for college. What happened? Nobody discussed it, and sometimes it felt like it didn't even happen. And I was left with all of that. Not as long as about 17 years old that a reporter show up, wanting to do an interview, opened up this book and showed me the Norman Rockwell painting and said, do you realize this is you? And I didn't. Up until that moment, I thought all of this was an incident that happened just on my street. I didn't realize that it was a part of a much bigger movement, the civil rights movement, and that I played this major role in it. I didn't realize that. So can you imagine all of that happening and then in a flash, it's over and it's almost like you dreamed it all? And you don't really even know who you are. My parents separated. I was then moved into the housing project, being raised by a single mom. Knowing that all this happened, but nobody knew who I was, nobody cared, but it was still there in me. It was like I'd seen it already. When we go back to thinking about Frederick Douglass, who said that, you know, the way he learned how to read is that his master's wife was teaching her kids how to read the Bible. He was always hiding and hearing that, and that's really how he learned to read and once. The master came home and found that he knew how to read. And he scolded his wife, saying, how could you do that? You are never to teach a nigger how to read. And he will never be a slave once that happens. And he said he didn't realize that the way out of slavery was through education. That it was too late that she had already given him an inch. And he wasn't going to rest until he had the yard. For me, it was like, it was too late. I'd already seen it. I already felt it. It was something there that I was supposed to do. Even though no one talked about it, I really felt like this means something. And when he opened that book and he showed me the Norman Rockwell, it cemented in my mind that I was right. And uh, so, no, nothing happened. And, and then again, from 17 to 30, I went on trying to find my own way, but not really, really stepping into my purpose until I was about 30. And then when that happened, which happened through a lot of other circumstances, um, that was it. It was, I accepted it. I stepped into it, and as my grandmother would put it, you will not be able to outrun your blessing once you step into your purpose. <laughs> I love it. Oh, I love that.
it's unimaginable. I, I am trying my best to even complicate the experience tonight. Um, I do want to talk about where you draw your inspiration. So I, I've read and you've spoken about your dad being your hero. And you mentioned early on that he was a Korean war vet, he returned home, and was not very welcomed, and very little support. I know that he was fired from his job as a result of you integrating an all white school. Um, how did his experience shape you? Did, is that where you draw inspiration around hope and the way you approach the world today? Um, I think he, I think, yes, I think my dad played a major role. They both did. I'm, I was truly a daddy girl. You know, I was the first born. My father was a, he had fought in the Korean War and he had come back home, but he was a very quiet, very humble person. He didn't really talk a lot. Uh, so I, I know now that I've gotten a lot from my father. Um, Yes, he was fired from his job. He, he was a service station attendant when he did get back. And uh, I remember that when he got fired that night, I distinctly remember it because he worked at a service station that was right next door to a bakery. And so when he was fired, the person that owned the bakery gave him all of the stuff that was in the bakery left over that night. And he came home with all of this stuff. And I remember all of the kids running around the table and with all these things and so happy about it. And yet I overheard them say that he was fired. And they told him that we know it's your uh, daughter that's going to the white school. His the service station, the person that owned the service station said that his customers were complaining about it. And so I remember that because in the midst of all the happiness about all the donuts and the bread and all the stuff we had, I felt like he was fired from, because of me. And uh, so that never left me. And um, But he was really very, very quiet, very humble. And um, I didn't really understand that for a long time. And then understand what strength it really took to be that humble, to be that quiet, strong person. My mother was just the opposite. You know, honestly, I didn't need federal marshals. All I needed was my mom. Anybody who <laughs> tried to come near me, my mom would have, you know, went off. She was just the opposite. But, yeah, I think a lot of my hope came from my father, the fact that you know, I was taught to say my prayer, the fact that I believed that my prayers would work. Uh, I was also very, very close to my grandmother. My mom's mom was a very, very strong woman. I mean, she had six daughters, two sons, all the girls did all of the work. They drove tractors, plowed the field. They, you know, my, my grandmother grew all of the crops. Um, and all of my aunts had kids, and we all would go to the farm every summer. You know, we had our own summer camp just with cousins, you know, like maybe 40 of us. But my grandmother made sure that we were all fed. You know, she would send all of the food home with us after the summer was over. I saw examples of a lot of hope around me. And, you know, it was so funny because I met someone else who said, Ruby, you know what? You are amazing because you can speak to frogs and presidents. <laughs> and I thought, you know what? That's true. <laughs> you know, I know what it's like to be poor. I know what it's like to run around bare feet and be in the fields. And, and I know what it's like to step into the White House and, uh, so, yeah, I think a lot of that stuff came from examples of the people around me. So I, I have a million more questions I could ask you. But the audience um, I know has a lot. I'm going to ask you one more question because I, I have to, I really have to remind on your, the work you do now with children. So you chose, made a conscious decision to dedicate your life to being an active inspiration cause. You work with kids all over this country. You've got school things in your honor. 
you write about your interactions with children in your even your most recent book, This Is Your Time. What about working with children gives you so much hope? Talk to us a little bit about that work because you could have chosen to do anything. And you chose well, first of all, first of all, as I said, I don't really believe I chose anything, to be honest with you. I believe that my path was already chosen for me. And, and I can go on and on about different things that happened in my life that would probably convince you of that. I am convinced. My life is already laid out. What I have to do is that I have to be obedient to stay on that path, to follow it, and to not let me get in the way. Like so many things happen in my life. It's just amazing to me. But it reassures me. It convinces me that Ruby, you did not do this. Now you can think that you made it happen. But you didn't, you know that you didn't do this. And so I have to be obedient to that. I have to. If that's being humble, then that's what it is. Because as my grandmother used to say, I do not want to fall from grace. But I know so many things that have happened in my life was not of my doing. But I do have a choice to try to follow my gut, to stay on the path. And when I don't, I can feel it. I can feel the uneasiness. And I know, as my grandmother would say, you stepped from underneath the covering and you got to get back. And so for kids, when I finally came in contact with some child in that school at first year, first grade, I remember I was hearing kids and I could never see them. They were really four or five kids remained in the school because white parents who wanted to bring their kids to school, they had to cross that same mob that I did. They were never protected by federal marshals. So when they did that, they were attacked. There's footage that we found showing them being attacked. Then when the kids got in the school, the principal who was part of the opposition, she would take the kids and she would hide them so that they would never see me and I would never see them. But Every now and again, because of the empty school building, I could hear them. So it was like they were haunting me, that I was on this quest to find them. And so finally, when I mentioned it to Mrs. Henry, I said, Mrs. Henry, I hear kids. What I didn't realize is that Mrs. Henry was going to the principal and advocating for me, saying, the law has changed. Kids are now supposed to be together, and yet you're hiding them from Ruby. If you don't allow them to come together, I'm going to report you to the superintendent. And so that forced them to allow her to take me to where they were, but they would never allow the kids to come into my class. So the minute I went in there that day, she opened the door, there they were. Four or five kids were sitting there, and I was so excited because I thought, I knew I heard kids. <laughs> Finally, I found them. And it, for me, it was just like, I found friends. And I went in. But this little boy looked at me and he said, I can't play with you. My mom said not to play with you because you're a nigger. And when he said that, it felt like this weight lifted off my shoulder. Honestly, because it felt like, so it's not Mighty Girl outside. And this isn't college. It's about me and the color of my skin. I mean, I heard that word. I knew it wasn't my name and pretty much wasn't something that even my parents liked. So he made it make sense. I didn't have to search for the kids anymore or wonder what was going on, why this school was so different, why these white men were here. I knew then. My first encounter was with racism with him wasn't the school I didn't realize it was a white school it was my school it was him but in my six year old mind what I heard him say was I can't play with you because you are a nigger my mom said not he didn't say I don't want to play with you 
So in my mind, if my mom had said, Ruby, don't play with him. He's Asian. He's Hispanic. Indian, Jewish, mixed race, gay, straight, white. You best believe Ruby would not be playing with him. Not when my mom said, don't play with him. So I thought he was explaining to me why he couldn't. And again, that made me realize it's not the kids. It's not me. It's his mom. And from that day to this one, I know and believe that each and every one of our babies, they come into the world with a very unique gift. That is a fresh start and a clean heart. That's what God gives us. And it is taken away from someone older takes racism and all these other feelings and pass them on to our kids. Racism is a grown-up disease. And we as adults are spreading it to the next generation and the next generation and the next. And I knew then when they asked me to write that first book, I didn't want to write a book just to write it because honestly I didn't think I could. But when I thought about it, I thought, what is it that I want them to take from this? And I thought that if I showed them what was really happening with all the photographs, that they read the newspaper article, and yet explained to them what I thought I would see, then they will see what I would see, and they will realize she's just a child. She's just innocent. And that's what protected me was the innocence of a child. Right now, I believe the fight that we are in, that all of us see unfolding before us today, it really doesn't have a whole lot to do with the color of our skin. Racism is a lot and doing well. And I believe it raised its ugly head even more so when President Obama was elected. But racism is just another tool used to divide us. There's many of them. Sexism. But we could go on and on. Religion. Racism is just another tool that they've been using and still using against us. What is dividing us is good and evil today. We see examples of it every day first hand for me my oldest son was murdered right here on the streets of new orleans shot 11 times by someone who looked exactly like him and he even dapped them off turned his back and they started shooting that was not a brother. He may have looked like a brother. That was evil cloaked like a brother. And we all know that they go into our school, our movie theaters, go into our churches, on and on and on, universities, everywhere. That's evil. Doesn't matter what they look like. We have got to stop picking and choosing who we want to align ourselves with to be in this fight because evil really doesn't care what you look like. Evil only wants you to open up and let it in. The good news that I want everybody on this line today to understand is this good is the same way. All good needs is for us to open up and let it in. And we need to stop and picking and choosing what we look like and align ourselves by our hearts and what is, what's inside. If we don't start to do that, evil is going to win. That's powerful. First of all, my heart goes out to you. Your condolences on the loss of your son. Um, that's powerful. Um, you're right, evil doesn't care what you look like. Evil is 
you know, I, I love the I love the way you find that. Um, we do have a time for maybe one question from the audience. They're gonna kill me. <laughs> I, know, I know we got like four minutes, but let me let me just try to take um one one that came in. We talked about inspiration earlier, but one person has asked, so current day, who who inspires you today? In this this time that we're in now. You know what? There's so many people, so I'm just gonna just run off really quickly. Um, Definitely, I had all that inspiration around me with my family, but somebody that I really, I definitely really admire, Dr. T. I know that sounds, you know, everybody, but when I think about sometimes how tired I am, maybe I'm afraid, whatever, and yet again, being obedient means you still have to step out of the corner. But Dr. King did that each and every day. Can you imagine? Not just being afraid for yourself. But he knew he was putting his family in danger. But he was obedient to that and continued to do that. And I do a lot of work with, with the Civil Rights Museum where he was assassinated. And, you know, they say that his autopsy showed that he had the heart of a 90-year-old man. That's stress. So he, I admired him so much. But then a person who was still here today that I admire is Mary Wright Edelman, who was a young civil rights attorney who marched with him and still in that fight for kids. And for me, when you asked me earlier about kids, was, you know, I knew at that point that I needed to reach the kids because that it wasn't them, that I needed to share my story and my message with them so that they understand that racism doesn't have a place in your minds and in your hearts, no matter what somebody older tells you. That is how my work started with kids. But there's so many people that... Uh, Today, I mean, my first uh, meeting with President Obama was amazing and so eye-opening because I thought it was just about he and I. I was excited about meeting the first black president, you know, and there he was. We were in this, this closed meeting and only about 12 people, and when he came to the door, I was like, oh, my God, this is a black man in the White House. And they say he's president, even though I voted for him, knew he was elected. It was different when he opened the door. And when he walked up to me and I said, Mr. President, it's such a pleasure to meet you. And I extended my hand, he put his hands on his hips, and he said, are you kidding me? I'm getting a hug. And he threw his arms around me. And in my ears, he whispered and he said, I cannot begin to tell you how amazing it is to welcome you into this White House under this administration. And when he said that, and I happened to look at the people that were around us, because my head was on his shoulders, all of them were tearing up and crying. And at that moment, I realized, I took myself out of it, and I thought, this isn't about me and him. It is about all of those lives that was lost, those marches, those lynchings, the voters of registration, everything. It was about everything that happened between he and I at that moment. That's what I saw in the tears and in the early faces. And I was so caught up in meeting the first black president that I, I was almost missing that. And that's what I mean about not allowing yourself to get in the way. To understand that you are just the vehicle that it's happening through. That's powerful. I'm, what a moment. I am, I feel like I'm being shared the story. I didn't know the story, but I knew there was a story about when you went to the White House and met President Obama. So I'm glad you shared that. Um, okay, so I was going to conclude with that question, but I am getting all types of me growls about like not getting the other questions. So, I'm gonna I'm gonna hit one more question hopefully. I'm, I'm gonna try to answer real quick so you can take all the <laughs> <time. laughs> um, You take all the time you you want. Um, so the, the other question, another question we got was knowing that you knowing what you know now. What advice would you give now to the six year old version of yourself? That advice would be Ruby. Don't worry about it. It's okay. It's all going to work out in the end. Wow. That's simple. That's simple. That's simple because, you know, I'm getting my dad. I remember when I was struggling 
And he was there, and he was there for me every weekend. Once he got paid, he'd come and he'd make sure that he can give me some money. And he said, you know what, baby? I don't want you to worry about those bills. He said, I want you to know it's all going to work out for you in the end. He was right. He was right. Yeah. <laughs> Clearly he was right. Um would be such an honor. I I don't even like normally at the end of this I would say thank you. That feels like it's not nearly enough. Um inspiring. You hear that word I'm sure all the time. I asked you about who inspired you, this gift you just gave to us, this hour of your time inspiring. I know I'm walking away uplifted and inspired. I, I'm looking at the chat. There's 1,400 folks on this call who are better than they were when they joined this call an hour ago because of you. So I, with the two words that I have for you, thank you. Thank you a million times for showing us what real resiliency looks like, for making what seems like the impossible possible and for gifting us with this hope that if we walk away from evil, embrace good, this world continues to get better. So, can't thank you enough. It will, it will definitely continue to get better, whether we live to see it or not. That's a whole other thing. You know, that's just do it. it. Don't expect that you will see results for yourself. But you know what? I'm better off for what Dr. King did what all, all these other people did before us, you know what I mean? You and I are sitting where we're sitting because of somebody else. Absolutely. So, you know, you just do your part. Do good. And, and I do believe what my father said is true. It's all going to work out because all good really wants is an opportunity. That's why we were brought here, to do work, be able to have good work through us. And so as long as we stay obedient to that, it's all going to work out in the end. I thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I really, really do because, like I said, you know, you and I can probably talk all day long. Yes. But it's not, even if I think I have something to say, you have given me the platform to.